In the mid-1980s, Roland would go on to release what would be one of their last analog Juno synthesizers, the Juno 106. And although there were a couple iterations after it, the Juno 106 was the most commercially successful out of all of the analog Juno Rolands. Today we're going to be asking the question, as we have in previous videos, is the Juno 106 still worth it? Both from a musical standpoint and a collector standpoint. Stay with us. I'm Zach Marr from Alamo Music here in San Antonio, Texas. You can find us online at alamomusic.com. If you haven't already, hit the subscribe button and turn on your notifications. This is our Alamo Sound Lab channel where we talk about all things music technology related. And today we're looking at the Juno 106 and asking the question, is it worth it? In order to answer it, we need to look at the history of the Roland Juno series and where the 106 fits into it. So while we were doing research on the Juno 106, it kept coming up that the Juno 106 was the most commercially successful of the entire Juno series. That was strange to me because the 6 and the 60 in today's market are more sought after than the 106. At least if you go by the pricing online. A Juno 106 you can still find for anywhere between $1,000 and $1,500, although prices very recently have gone all the way up to $2,000. And a Juno 60 and a Juno 6 are hard to find for under 2000 They mostly go above at this point. So it's strange to me that the 106 was the most commercially successful out of that series. Maybe that's why they're priced differently, that there's more available of the 106. But if you read on forums as well, people seem to like the 60 better for whatever reason. So when we were looking at it, we couldn't find a definitive answer for why the 106 was a better seller than the 60 and the 6. So here's our take. From what I could read, the 106 had a few things that the 60 did not, and it came out at a time where since we're switching from analog to digital, with the DX7 coming out, I think, in the 1983 or 1984, the whole world was shifting towards digital synthesis, and the price point was also coming lower. So people were trying to figure out ways to cut costs and building synthesizers and so the Juno 106 was actually less expensive when it came out than the Juno 60. It also had a number of features that the Juno 60 did not, such as full MIDI implementation, one of the first Roland analog synths to have that, as well as Portamento. And it also had double the patch memory. So you were getting a lot more for less, and that's always a good equation for selling more products. So I can see where the 106 had a value proposition, people that wanted a 60 suddenly were able to get something very like it with more features. Makes sense why this would sell more. So that's my take. If you have any knowledge that isn't commonly known, please share it below. I'd love to hear from someone that knows more than we do about this and why the 106 was the most popular. But that set aside, the 106 was unique in that it also, the high pass filter, when you have it all the way to the bottom, it gives you a bass boost. So it's very, it's got a very heavy bass sound, which house and techno music from the 90s took a lot of advantage of. You can also put it into a unison monophonic mode that allows you to get massive kind of monophonic tones out of this thing with the bass boost. So it was reading, I read an article by some, uh, an interview with some of the Roland engineers behind the 106, and they said the goal with the 106 was to make it sound as large as possible with the most cost cutting done at the same time. So it was, it was the reference point was uh, some of the massive Roland uh, King polyphonic synths like the Jupiter 8. And they were, the, the Juno series was like an affordable, more affordable analog synth that musicians could kind of get into and kind of strip down to the bare, to, to, bare bones kind of basic subtractive synthesis, which is part of their magic. They're very easy to program and to use. And so they were, with the 106, they were actively trying to cut costs to make it more affordable, hence it being less than the 60. And it's interesting, There's a he said in that interview that they actually use less, the quality of parts 
was lower in the 106 than the 60. And you can kind of see that when you compare the two side by side. And it's, it's common in like the SH-101 from Roland when you compare it to the monophonic synths from the 70s, like the SH-2. The 101 build quality, is, there's a lot more plastic. It feels less hunky and less like tank-like. Whereas the, the synths from, and the drum machines from the earlier 80s and the late 70s are a lot more, uh, they feel a lot more, the, the quality materials seem a lot more expensive. It just, they feel more expensive. So the 106 materials were less expensive than the ones used in the 60, but it had more features that were interesting to musicians. And if you look at it today and you, and you take one of these, the main thing that you need to know is that they have a lot of issues. The 106 is notorious for the voice chips going out and needing to be replaced. Fortunately, there's a lot of aftermarket parts that you can replace the 106 um, voice chips when they go out, but it's almost universal that a 106 without voice chips replaced, if you buy one, they're going to go out on you. And at this point, pretty quickly because of the age of these units. And that was due to a, a resin that, was, um, that the chips were encoded with um, that over time, I, I don't know exactly the technical reason, but over time it caused the issues with the voice chips. There are lots of fixes, and it's not a huge issue, but it is something to be aware of if you're buying a Juno 106 sight unseen. What's also interesting is there's two other versions of the 106. There's the HS60 and the Juno 106S, and they have speakers built in. They were home versions of the 106, and you can disconnect the speakers. It's hard to turn them off. I think you have to disconnect them internally, but you can find those very cheap compared to a 106. They're even less expensive, probably the least expensive Juno that you can find besides the Alpha Juno 1 or Juno 2. And the 106 is still, in my opinion, musically very interesting. It, it's, it's, a, it's got a very warm sound and it is, it's, it's, it's very close to a Juno 60. So you get the Juno 60 feel. Um, it's a little less, in my mind, a little less aggressive. It's a little bit, uh, it's more patty, stringy, and uh, bass heavy than the, the 60, which to me is cuts through and is very articulate. And, and it sounds kind of almost biting at times. And the chorus on it is equally beautiful to the Juno 60. So it's got a beautiful chorus. The unison mode is fantastic. The bender is really fun because you can modify the filter as well as the LFO rate and the pitch. So the, and the portamento is a really fun thing to, that you don't get on the 60 that, that is, gets a really interesting squelchy kind of movement when you're playing with it. So I, I love the Portamento. The MIDI makes, you don't have to retrofit it with MIDI. It's got great, great MIDI implementation. And um, the Bender all make it to me way worth it if you want a vintage Juno and you want the sound. It's probably still the best value proposition out of the series. So that's kind of what I think about it musically. There are alternatives. There's the DeepMind 12. Um, and the whole DeepMind series from Behringer, which was modeled after the 106. Although the Behringer DeepMind is actually got a lot more features than the 106. The one thing I would say that's different is it doesn't have, uh, it has digital effects, which some people really don't like. The chorus on the Juno 106 is magical in its own right, and you don't really get that on the DeepMind. But the DeepMind does have an additional oscillator it's got a lot of onboard effects, and it's 12 voice as opposed to 6 voice polyphony. It's very powerful, pretty awesome. We're going to feature it a little bit so you can kind of hear how it's similar and also how it's different. Great kind of emulation and modern alternative. The JU06A from Roland is their digital emulation using their ACB technology, and it also does a fantastic version of giving you the 106 in a small module, very affordable but it is digital and it is an emulation. I think personally it sounds so close that it's negligible. The difference is negligible, but for someone that truly wants an analog synth, you really either need to do the 106 or the DeepMind. And the 106 still is has some things about it that are unique that are not totally replicatable in the DeepMind or the JU06A. They're all great instruments, but 
there's still something magical musically about the 106 if you're willing to put up with the voice chip issue and just the maintenance issues that come with vintage analog synths. From a value standpoint and a collector standpoint, the prices on these things are going through the roof right now. And I have no idea why, and it could change. In the 90s, apparently, the 106 is what everybody wanted, and the 60 was cheaper than the 106. That's changed in the last 10, 15 years. The 60 goes for more. The 106 you can is kind of the budget one now. But prices seem to be going up pretty extremely. I looked at Reverb this morning, and I saw the... The cheapest one I could find was 17 or 1800 bucks, which is a lot more than I just looked a year ago. I remember and oh, a year ago we picked this up and it was a thousand bucks. So they've almost doubled. I don't know if that's going to continue that trend. It could. It's a good bet that these will continue to gain value like anything vintage. But is it gaining value musically? No, it's just gaining value for the fact that it's becoming more and more collectible as more and more of these disappear from the face of the earth and you are parted out or die. Um, so if you're willing to risk the, owning one of these and potentially having it die on you, but holding it for value standpoint or collector standpoint, it's worth it. But again, that's a risk. That's a game that you have to play on your own and be comfortable with the risk. It's not, it's not a safe investment in any, in any way. So without saying too much more, let's listen to it. And we're going to do some clips also of the JU06 and the Deep Mind so you can get a sense of how this sounds in comparison. But we'll take a listen and then we'll wrap it up.
The Juno 106 definitely has an iconic tone, and I hope the demo kind of showed you or reminded you of some of the songs that this has been used in. It's, it's in a lot of synth pop, it's in a lot of house and techno music. It's been used iconically so many times. It's a great instrument, it's a great contribution to not only music history, but sonic history. So I really love the Juno 106. I also hope the DeepMind and the JU06A gave you alternatives that you could add this 106 sound to your palette and use it in ways that are more or get one at a more affordable price point. Other things I didn't mention that are alternatives to the 106 are the Roland Cloud technology where you can basically, uh, it's a VST version of the 106 and the Jupiter X and XFM both have a 106 voice in built into it as well. So. It's using ACM talk technology, which is different than their ACB, but it's also really good emulation. So in conclusion, is the Juno 106 worth it? To answer that, I think we need to say, to qualify it in two ways. First, from a collector standpoint, I do think that it's collectible. I do think it's part of music history. It's worth owning if you are really into having that historical piece in your collection. This is one of the greats. And they're not going, there's never going to be more made and there's going to be just less and less over time. You all, you do run the risk of it dying, but there are a fair amount of parts and technicians that know how to work on the 106 and it's not a terribly complex analog synth. 
So it's not the most dangerous vintage synth to own, like a Yamaha CS80, for instance. But it is definitely collectible. And with prices continuing to climb, I think that if you're a collector, why not? From a musical standpoint, you know, I don't think it's the most... It's not a sound that you can't get from a number of different instruments. The DeepMind does a great job. The, the ACB Roland technology in the cloud or their instruments does a great job. It's not the most complex synth. It's a basic, basic subtractive synth with two waveforms and single LFO and a, a low and high pass filter. It's, it's pretty basic. So the amount of sound sculpting that you can do with it is limited. It does have a great layout. It's really easy and intuitive to use and it's a lot of fun. But if you're, on a, if you're trying to figure out how to build out your, your, uh, your arsenal of, of sound, I don't know if I would say the 106 is a great investment when you could get all these other options at smaller, and both in smaller sizes and also at lower price points. That said, it is always nice to be inspired musically by an instrument. You know, if this, even if the sound can be replicated, there is something to be said about every in instrument and its inspiration on the musician and the, the tactile nature and the sense of history, even when you're playing. I mean, the creation of art is an emotional thing. And there is something moving about playing on a piece of history and the uh, sense of kind of its journey with your journey can create magic. Is it something that you could tell when you're listening to a track, whether or not it was a Juno 106 or an emulation? Maybe not, but some, you, you can't... Uh, inspiration is often hard to find, and I think there's a lot of inspiration in every 106. So that's kind of my two thoughts on it. What are your thoughts? I'd love to hear below any commentary you have. Did I leave any facts out that should have been that I should have said, did I get anything wrong? Please let me know below. If there's any other instruments you think we should cover, please also write it below. We've, we're keeping a list and we are hopefully we'll get to all those soon. And again, if you want to talk more, visit us on alamomusic.com. You can chat with us there, give us a call, email us. We'd love to chat anything music technology related. And we hope you enjoyed this segment of Is It Worth It? Talk to you later.